Good morning. Please join with me in singing number 516, 516, To Christ Be True. We'll sing verses 1 and 3, and then we'll have our scripture reading and prayer. 516. Let's sing out. To Christ be loyal and be true is a banner beyond the furl. And born aloft till he secure the conquest of the world. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go. the Lord be true. To Christ be loyal and be true in the noble service prove your faith and your fidelity fervor of your love. To Christ the Lord be This morning will be taken from the book of John. I'll be reading from the King James Version. I'll be reading verse 1 through 6 of chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. If you have your Bibles, please follow along. If not, would you give kind and reverent attention? to the reading of God's Word. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go... And prepare a place for you, I will come again. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Would you bow as we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you saw fit to have it preserved for us, even to this day. We pray that you'd bless us now, our teachers and those of us as students, as we go to our classes, that we may study from that word and prayerfully learn how to be better children of yours. Bless us through Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome this morning to the Bremen Church of Christ. We're thankful for your presence here for our Lord's Day Bible study. Thankful for the mild weather and for the opportunity we have to join together. We'll dismiss now with the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes.
middle school, high school, and adult classes. of Jude in this class. It's good to see each of you here this morning. <clears throat> Book of Jude. Jude writing. As we noted earlier, um, obviously had some things he wanted to write of a different nature than that which he did write, but said it was needful to write to these brethren that they should earnestly contend for the faith. And so that's the purpose of this, basically the purpose of the entire letter, is to deal with the matter of apostasy. Number one, to encourage these brethren not to fall away from the truth, turn from the truth, but at the same time to encourage them not to tolerate those who would turn away from the truth. <clears throat> I think to get the book of Jude in its proper context, at least in principle, Think back to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That's the first part of the verse. That would prevent these brethren from turning away from the Word of God to something else. <clears throat> the second part of Ephesians 5 verse 11 says, Rather rep reprove them that do. Those have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but reprove them. Now, <clears throat> so we don't, we're not going to, we're not going to apostatize, we're not going to turn away from the truth, but we're not going to sit idly by while others try to lead folks away. That's basically what Jude is writing here. That is, he does not want these brethren to turn away from the truth. <clears throat> At the same time, he does not want them to sit idly by while false teachers try to lead brethren astray. And so that's what we're going to see basically throughout this letter. We have, we're in the middle of verse 3 in our study when time ran out last week. Beloved, <clears throat> when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered <clears throat> unto the saints. We had talked about the matter of beloved, warm feeling toward these brethren because they were uh, children of God. We had talked about the common salvation of which he wanted to write, <clears throat> that is, a salvation that he enjoys, a salvation they enjoy, not that it is common, nothing special about it, but that it is common in that everyone has access to it who will meet the conditions thereof. And so we talked about the common salvation. We talked about the matter of contending earnestly for the faith. And so what does the word contend mean? Or contend earnestly? What's he say? <clears throat> All right, it's certainly, I mean, if it, if it doesn't, if we don't understand anything else about it, if we don't understand the degree that is involved here, we could not miss the point that Jude is saying, brethren, you need to get involved in this matter and not just allow it to go unattended. Now, when you come down to verse 4, he says there's certain men crept in unawares. 
<clears throat> and so there are folks who need to be dealt with in the situation. So to earnestly contend would at least say, get involved in this thing. Now, Jim also mentioned the fact that literally the word contend means to wrestle with. Uh, the idea of exertion. Put forth some effort. Put forth some energy in dealing with those men who are trying to lead folks away from the truth. And so that advice, that instruction for us would be just as applicable today as it would have been when Jude wrote this letter. <clears throat> it is a part of God's Word. And whenever men are going in a direction to lead people away from the truth, that is not a matter to ignore. Certainly not a matter to, in, in which we should participate, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. It won't allow us to do that. Neither will it allow us to just sit by and watch it happen. Now, <clears throat> to whom is Jude writing this letter? To Christians. You know, if you put this in a modern setting, there might be those who, at least in the back of their minds, while they might not express it, would say, that's right, elders, y'all need to make sure that nobody comes in here and leads this church astray. Is that what you'd say? Absolutely not. <clears throat> now, there are passages within the qualifications and work of elders that would involve the elders in doing that. But this passage is written to brethren. And so... How are we going to contend earnestly for something about which we know little or nothing? <clears throat> it's going to be basically impossible. So when Jude writes to brethren to earnestly contend for the faith, now what is the faith? <clears throat> it's the gospel system, the body of the gospel, the the process, that the, all that is involved. Now, what is the gospel? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? It's the revealed Word. Yeah. We, we sometimes think about the gospel as being re hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. The gospel involves the entirety of the system that will ultimately lead folks to heaven. Now... <clears throat> If we don't know that gospel, we're not familiar with that gospel. Number one, how are we going to know when somebody's teaching us something contrary to it and ultimately leading us away from it? We're not going to know. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. <clears throat> King James says, Study to show thyself approved. The American Standard and literally give diligence to show thyself approved. Now, that involves study, doesn't it? So the word study there is not a, not a misrepresentation of the Greek. It's just, it's just the translator's way of saying <clears throat> what the original says. Give diligence to show thyself approved unto God. Well, how do we know when we're approved of God? Well, we know what He wants us to do, and we know we're doing that to the best of our ability. And so all of that simply says to us that we as individual brethren need to spend time with the book. We need to know the gospel. And then when someone comes by who teaches something contrary to it, then we'll, we'll recognize it. <clears throat> and it is so sad how that is not the case in the lives of so many brethren today. They wouldn't know false doctrine if it slapped them upside the head simply because they don't spend time with the book. I believe that's one reason why churches all across this country and yea, even in other parts of the world are so easily led away from the truth. I remember surveying, this goes back, whew, many more years than I'd like to believe. <clears throat> and I can guarantee the situation's gotten worse, not better. But uh, I remember Brother Woods talking about, Brother Guy Woods, talking about a survey that was done among brethren. And the survey basically revealed 
that somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of brethren did not know why we do not use mechanical instruments of music in worship. 50%. Now that's bad enough. But 50% of that 50% could care less. As I said, I guarantee you it hasn't gotten any better <clears throat> since that survey was done about 40 years ago. And we see this happening all over the brotherhood. Folks, congregations of people who have on their sign Church of Christ out front are introducing mechanical instruments of music in worship. How can that be? They don't know. And a lot of them don't care to know. And so that's the sad part about it. So <clears throat> within this statement to earnestly contend for the faith would be, number one, the fact that we as individual Christians, must know the faith. We need to know what's in this book. And then number two, when somebody comes along teaching something contrary to it, then what are we going to do? Say, well, I don't, you know, I, I don't know what I'm going to do about it. No, we better know what to do about it. We better contend earnestly for the faith. That means we contend against whatever's being promoted that's contrary to to the faith. So, so when you read this little statement, earnestly condemned for the faith, don't just pass over it because there are tremendous lessons involved there for those of us who are of the sanctified called as suggested in verse 1. <clears throat> so we need to know the book. And then when, when somebody comes along teaching something contrary to it, we'll be able to <clears throat> contend for that. So there's some, there's some critical lessons here in our tolerant, permissive society in the church. Here's some tremendous lessons for us in that regard. So we want to contend earnestly for the faith. It's something that we can do. It's something that we are authorized to do. It is something that we are commanded to do. Now, what more do we need to do it? <clears throat> if, it's, if it's authorized, if it's commanded, and it's something we can do, then we had better be about doing it. And if we don't know how to do it, then we'd better be beginning to prepare ourselves to do it. And so there's, like I said, some very critical lessons here in this verse in view of a lot of things that are going on even among some of our own brethren. So then you'll notice as well, and this is where I wanted to really come back to today, contend earnestly for the faith. We understand what that is. Then what does he say? Which was once delivered unto the saints. Once delivered delivered. Very significant statement there. Literally, the word once in the original suggests once for all time. <clears throat> now, why is that important? <clears throat> exactly. Now, that's a very common thing today to hear, you know, uh, I'll tell you what the Lord said to me. The Lord told me to do this. The Lord told me to do that. Not so. Unless they're talking about something that's revealed in His Word that He's already given. Because this little word, once, suggests once for all time. You have the same word in Hebrews um, chapter 9, and, and, and uh, you're, you're familiar with it, with reference to the death of, of our Lord. So Christ was once offered. What does that suggest? The original, once for all time. He's not going to have to ever be delivered again. You got the same word right here, the faith that was once delivered, once for all time. doesn't have to be delivered anymore. So that takes care of any uh, modern day uh, revelation it takes care of any addition 
takes care of any subtraction, takes care of any substitution, alteration, modification at all to what has already been delivered. And so when you hear people talk about <clears throat> anything being revealed in our day and time, you know that they don't know what Jude 3 says because that's exactly what it says. So we must, uh, we must be ready to defend the faith that has been delivered for all time. So they, they must be, these brethren must be earnest and exact in what they defend. <clears throat> been my observation, sadly, through the years, that there have been more brethren who were more determined to contend and defend their opinion than they are the Word of God. If they have an opinion about something, they don't want to hear what the Word of God has to say about it. And they'll pretty much tell you that. So these folks, he's telling them exactly what they must defend. It does make a difference what we defend and that for which we contend. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5, in that list of ones, what did Paul write about the matter of faith? One faith. There's just one. Just one. And so that's the one for which we must contend in that regard. And so uh, that's really such a, a pertinent passage to us in our day and time. Back in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22 and in verse 30, God says through Ezekiel, <clears throat> And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. Now who can quote the latter part of that verse? <clears throat> but I found none. Now think about that. Think about that. That's in Ezekiel's day. God says, I, I was seeking a man among my people. That, that's obviously the context there. I was seeking a man among my people who could stand between my judgment against Israel. Obviously, somebody that he could depend on that could maybe even explain to him, why are these people living the way they're living, you know? Standing, I was looking for a man to stand in the hedge, to, to stand between me and my wrath against the nation of Israel. And he said, I couldn't find one. That might be, in my opinion, the second darkest verse in all of the Bible. The darkest to me is in the Revelation letter when Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's written to brethren. Some brethren had put the Lord on the outside of their heart. He's wanting back in, but he's not going to force his way. But then for God to say, I, I couldn't find a man. I don't know all of the implications of that. <clears throat> I know that there were men like Ezekiel. I know there were prophets during that day. I don't believe the verse suggests that that God is saying here there was not one single righteous man among all of Israel at that point in time. I don't believe that's what he's saying. But he was looking for a man to stand up for his people. And everybody had the attitude of complacency. Do you think? Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. <clears throat> Then you've got um, in Acts chapter 20 when Paul was meeting with the Ephesian elders in Miletus. Uh, you come down to <clears throat> verse uh, 26 and 27. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all 
the counsel of God. Paul was ready, wasn't he? Matter of fact, on another occasion, writing to the Philippian brethren, he said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. That's where we need to be. That's what Jude 3 is, is saying to us in that regard. We need more men like that today who are willing, and I say men, I'm talking about men and women, I'm talking about brethren, who are willing in the face of distractions, in the face of departures, in the face of those who would lead us away from the truth, in the face of those who would speak against the Lord's church and the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we need people who are willing to stand up and speak up and defend the truth. We need more people like that. We need to prepare ourselves for that. And that takes a lot of study, doesn't it? Maybe that's why more folks are not more prepared today is we just are not willing to take the time and put forth the effort that it takes. So now he gives the reason, coming down to verse 4, for all that he has said in the first three verses. For there are certain men, crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, or denying the only, yeah, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you'll notice what he says about them. What kind of men are they? Ungodly men. So he says there's some men who have, have crept in unawares. What does that really say? They got in secretly, slipped in the back door. Incidentally, if you're keeping up with the uh, running basic outline that I, that I started uh, giving you initially, uh, you'll notice in verse 1 what kind of people are going to do what Jude encourages and commands them to do in this section. They're going to be, number one, people who are aware of who they are. Verse 2, they're going to be people who have an appreciation for who they are. In verse 3, they're going to be, the first part of verse 3, they're going to be aroused to face this apostasy because they enjoy a common salvation. In the latter part of verse 3, there are going to be people who are armed. You can't contend for the faith if you're not armed to contend for the faith. And then verse 4, they are going to be people who are alert to what is happening. And so that's what Jude is, that's what Jude is doing in all of this letter. He's, he's letting them know who they are, what they enjoy, now what they need to be doing. And so he's making them alert that there are certain men crept in unawares, uh, kind of like um, through a side door, if you please, using figurative language there. Um, think about a, an escaped convict. What is, how does an escaped convict act when he, when he gets away from the jail? Does he just go right down the middle of town to the most public coffee shop and sit there and drink coffee like uh, they don't know who I No, no, no. That's, he slips around, slips around, doesn't want anybody to recognize who he is or what he is for fear that he'll be reported. Well, that's pretty much the idea of this phrase, crept in, slipped in, just like an escaped convict slips around the community lest he be found out. That's the idea that's involved in this regard. Back in uh, John chapter uh, 10 and in verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Now that's who Jude's talking about right here. 
those who are trying to, to slip in to do damage to the body of Christ. So they're not going to come in and announce we're false teachers. Our motive is what we can get out of this materially. They're not gonna, that's not the way they approach things at all. Another passage that you might think of in this regard, in, in Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 15, Jesus told us to beware of certain people. Who? Beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. What are they doing? They're being deceptive. They're not being up front. Acts 20 and verse 29. After Paul had given encouragement to those elders, take heed to yourselves. He said, For I know this, that after my departure, men shall arise even among your own selves, and they won't spare the flock. Those are the kinds of people that, that Jude is talking about right here that have crept in unawares in that regard. And so really what, what Jude is doing here is these folks... Has anybody in here ever been to a, a, a party where you wear masks or costumes to try to be unrecognizable? <laughs> I, I remember going to a birthday party of a gentleman in the congregation where I was preaching at that time. And I got a wig that Ann had at that time, which she no longer wears. And I put that thing on, and I put a stocking over my face. If you've ever done that, you know what that'll do distortion-wise. And I dressed in such a way that, that I was totally unrecognizable, and I went to that party, and I pretended that I was flirting with this brother. And he did not know who I was. He had no clue who I was. And there was a woman who was there at that party who was so afraid of me that she wound up and was out on a farm. She went all the way to the barn to get away from me. That's how bad I looked, I guess. Nobody had a clue who I was till I took the mask off. Well, that's exactly what Jude is doing right here. Jude is taking the mask off of these folks who have crept in unknowing to those obviously there who they really are. Now, Jude is not the only one, and we, we studied this back in um, 2 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> when Peter wrote in verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophets among you, who privily, what's that word privily? Well, sometimes we define it as, as privately, but, but literally it's the same idea as crept in over here. They, they slipped in. They, they came in unannounced as to who they are. And they're going to bring in damnable heresies, denying the Lord that bought them, bring upon themselves swift destruction. And then he goes on and talks about and gives a, a, a pretty good description of them, even as Jude does right here to these folks. And so they have, they have crept in unawares. So here's their method. Here's their method. And, and I'm going to give you some, some, a couple of things here in this connection. But, but in this alert that he's giving them here, he's basically saying being, be alert to their method. This is how they come in. So their motive is obvious because of their, their method. So he further says then, these men that have crept in unawares, who before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now, if you'll drop down to verses 14 and 15, you'll find a good commentary on that phrase. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these sex. See? So he's explaining what he just got through saying. They were, of old, you were told that there would be people like this and the condemnation that would be theirs as a result of what they're doing. So 
So he's not talking about here before of old as any kind of, of, uh, of choice on God's part to what these men would be and consequently the condemnation. That's, that's not what he's saying. It's not this predestination idea. But we were told of old that there'd be people like this. And, and we were also told of old that, that when there were men like this, what the condemnation would be of them. Now in verses 14 and 15, he's explaining that Enoch prophesied of them, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his angels to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly men of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their, of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So that's what Enoch said about it. Now we'll deal more with what Enoch said when we get there, but, but I just want you to see that, that what he's saying here, that these men who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, now verses 14 15 explain that. Enoch told them by prophecy. Well, what about us today? Could we honestly say today that we were told of old that there would be such men and what their condemnation would be. Sure, uh, we have that. That's what God's Word tells us in that regard. And so that's really all He's saying in that particular verse. So there's no reference here to, to predestination of these particular men as, as some people, but, but that all who follow the course of these men, these kinds of men, this is what they can expect. There's a difference in foreknowledge and predestination as it is used in the religious world. Then he refers to them as, as ungodly men. Ungodly men. What, what does that suggest? No respect for God. Opposed to God. They blaspheme anything that relates to religion. They're just not any shape, form, or fashion interested in God and God's way. And that's really what the word ungodly in this context means. So that, that tells you something about them in that regard. So, so what are they doing? They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Now, what is their method of operation? They creep in unaware. What is their message? It is a message of lasciviousness. Not the message of the true grace of God, but it's a message of lasciviousness. Now we find that word used in other places. But when you think about this idea of turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, what is lasciviousness? How would you define that word lasciviousness? Lewdness? Evil? Immoral? I found one definition of the word just simply said gross, fleshly indulgence. That pretty tough definition, I guess. But so, what were these men doing? How, how do you turn the grace of God into lasciviousness? How do you do that? Hmm? The adotrophies. There were those in Jude's day, in Paul's day who would try to use fleshly lust as a form of religion, would try to, try to incorporate um, matters of religion into, into their fleshly practices as if it was a part of God's will. That's what these guys were doing. They, they were trying to, to convince people that that when you do these gross fleshly things, that's, 
That's just showing you spirituality. Now, you would think that anybody with half common sense would know better than that. But that's obviously not the case. I've stated it before. I believe the further away from the truth that you can get with some new religion, the greater your following is going to be. That seems to be the mindset of so many people. The further away from the truth it is, the more spectacular you can make it sound, the greater your following is going to be. As you look at those folks today who are growing by leaps and bounds, and you read what they write, and you hear what they have to say, and you'll think, where in the world are they finding that in the Scriptures? Anything closely akin to that in the Scriptures? But look at their following. Then you look at the numbers who are following the pure, simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Doesn't make sense, but that's the way it is. And that's what Jude writes in, in this regard. So he certainly, number one, doesn't want these brethren, to whom he refers to as beloved in verse 3, he certainly doesn't want to see them go that direction. Doesn't want to see them do that. In 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, we alluded to that a moment ago. Uh, in verses um, 18 and 19, these are wells without water. Now, Peter's talking about the same kind of people. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried, carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great, swelling words of vanity... They allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, or of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought into bondage. But there again, Peter talks about the same thing. Those who are putting out these speeches, who make it seem like that these fleshly, the fulfillment of these fleshly lusts is in some way a degree of spirituality, but it's lasciviousness and you can't make anything else out of it. John wrote about it in 1 John 2, 1 John 3. We're not going to take the time to go back there. So they turn God's amazing grace into a cheap grace to cover their indulgence in the ways of the flesh. Jude doesn't want these brethren to follow that. And he wants them to deal with those who are doing that. Lord willing, we'll pick up there next Sunday morning.